What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here coming at you with one of our final episodes for the Big Ten and 31 Days theme. We have been trucking through this month. We're joined by Drew Scott, who is a Northwestern insider, web editor for the Daily Northwestern. I just want to say I appreciate you joining me today, man. Yeah, Zach, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing Northwestern football in the Big Ten uh, for the 2021 season. And yeah, looking forward to getting started. Absolutely. But we got to go back to 2020 real quick. It was a great season, I would say, for Northwestern. Seven and two, had an amazing mm -hmm. season, one of the best in recent memory. They up, they beat Auburn in the bowl game. I mean, everything kind of went their way this year. Did this season, based on your preseason expectations, meet, exceed, or fall short of fall short of those expectations? So, 2020 was gonna, is gonna was gonna be a really interesting season for Northwestern. The Wildcats in 2018, they win the Big Ten West title losing the Big Ten Championship to Ohio State, but they win the Holiday Bowl against Utah. And then the next year, Clayton Thornton, one of the best passing program history, he moves on. Northwestern brings in Hunter Johnson, five-star Clemson transfer. The quarterback transition doesn't go as well as planned. The offense is one of the weakest in the country. It averages only 16.3 uh, points per game and three, less than 300 yards. The team goes 3-9. and nine. Offensive coordinator Mick McCall is fired and or leaves the team and kind of heading into 2020, there was this question of was 2018 an actual sign that Northwestern was moving up and improving or was it kind of lucky because the rest of the Big Ten West wasn't as strong, Iowa, Wisconsin, and those were teams Northwestern beat. So that was really something I had an eye on heading into 2020. And then Pat Fitzgerald, head coach of Northwestern, goes and hires Mike Bajaki and at Central Michigan, Tennessee, Boston College, his NFL experience, with the Buccaneers, he cares a lot about get, a lot about getting the ball to his playmakers, and he replaces McCall. And then Peyton Ramsey from Indiana, who made who was an All Big Ten honorable mention despite a quarterback competition with Michael Penix Jr., comes in and helps provide some stability at the quarterback spot after 2019. And even though the offense loses Rashawn Slater, who's now going to be a top 15 draft pick, it still keeps so many aspects, such as one of the best linebacking cores in the Big Ten and in the country, nonetheless, of Patty Fisher, Blake Gallagher, and Chris Bergen. And if you look at those things and put them into respective, those hires, those players, I thought 2020 was going to be a bounce back year, and it seemed to be that way. And obviously, I think we'll talk about this later, but the Big Ten had a very staggered schedule in terms of how they were going to play football games with COVID, and there were a lot of different decisions floating around, a lot of dates where the conference changed course. But Northwestern was one of the programs who, uh, when play started, they took advantage of it. Originally in the preseason, I thought the team was going to go six and two. Wisconsin and Minnesota, I mean, those two programs had great 2019s. That game in Minneapolis was essentially the Big Ten West title game that Wisconsin won. And kind of those were my two games where I thought the Wildcats would see some struggles. And I thought that Halloween matchup at Kinnick would be kind of the defining factor of the season. And the team started off the season great. I mean, a 43 to three win against Maryland. The defense gets three picks. Ramsey shows himself as a dual threat quarterback who can score both on the air and on the ground. It showed Bajakian's offense incredibly well in the first game. And that's when I knew that this Northwestern season was likely going to exceed my expectations. As I mentioned, that 21 to 20 victory in Iowa City at Kinnick, which, which was defined as a classic Big Ten game, ground and pound uh, run game, three interceptions by the Northwestern defense, including a game clincher that, uh, to beat the Hawkeyes. That's kind of the defining factor of what I saw in this team and why they helped exceed expectations. It was defined by hard fought, close victories, and they could win them in different ways. It was, they were playing trademark Bay 10 football. As I mentioned, the victory over the Hawkeyes was defense in a run game. Against Purdue, Peyton Ramsey found Ramal Chiakiao Bowman, who last scored a touchdown during his, I believe it was his freshman year. He scored three in one game, along with 86 yards to beat Purdue. And then against Wisconsin, uh, and I believe it was the third game of the season. Obviously, Merch comes in with a lot of hype after that opening game against Illinois that he has, and then Wisconsin beating Michigan by 38 points. Northwestern forces five turnovers and wins and wins by 10. And the team proved they could win. And even though they lost games such as Ohio State, there were still solid moments in them, such as the kind of Brandon Joseph interception in the end zone that showed they could hang with these top talent, that they could make plays against them. And even though they did lose 22 to 10, to miss a chance at winning their first outright big title in a long time. The fact that they led a team at halftime by four points that made it to the national championship and beat Clemson by 28, 
uh, beat Clemson by three touchdowns, nonetheless, is incredibly impressive. And then beating Auburn in arguably the best bowl game outside of the New Year's Six was great. And Ramsey, who eventually declared for the NFL draft, saved his best game for last. 212 yards in the air, 47 on the ground, three touchdowns. And Auburn, even though they had four losses, three of those losses came against great teams in Georgia, Alabama, and Texas A&M. And finishing the year in the AP Top 10, Northwestern showed the country that it could compete. And it did exceed my expectations. And I think it's going to make for a very interesting 2021. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it definitely will. And, you know, one of the monikers that was given to this team was the fighting Reese Davises by Joey Galloway on one of the playoff shows. What was the reaction around Northwestern by the fans, the, you know, in, in city media, the team? And did it help them kind of play that underdog role throughout the season? So our game day team, which is our five writers on the daily we had an exit survey in which we were kind of discussing our takeaways of the season. And one of the questions asked was, what is one quote that finds the season? As soon as I'm like, fighting Reese Davis says, I'm like, no question. So ba- basically when Galloway on that call says, honestly, they've got a bunch of deep Reese Davises running around out there. And then Northwestern beats Wisconsin 17 to seven in one of the best defensive game the teams have played. Obviously does a, it, it, it's a huge statement. Fitz after the game in a press conference, uh, Pat Fitzgerald, said it really ticked off the team and he thought it was incredibly disrespectful. And what Pat Fitzgerald talked about was that it needs to be fuel in the engine. And that's what it became for the rest of the season. Greg Newsom, the second uh, cornerback, who's now going to, who's now considered a, a possible first round pick talked about kind of how we found it funny that that's how people view the team. And that's the narrative around Northwestern, but that they'll just keep working and it'll keep fueling them. Like Fitz said, and I, I, th- this was published, I think, a few days after the game happened. Throughout the week, kind of Northwestern was recording the team in practice, and it clearly showed that the comments made impact. The players were saying stuff like, Good morning, Reese. Reese Davis with the catch. I believe uh, senior wide receiver Riley Lee said, My name is Riley Reese Davis. And then some other players said, All I see is a bunch of Reese Davises. And obviously, that kind of hearing that nickname obviously provides a ton of ammunition. And it did, and it had a lot of impact kind of around fans and college football across the country. Uh, from the fan angle, sweatshirts and T-shirts were created. Media followed it closely. And I think it definitely did provide some firepower for that huge Big Ten West rivalry game, a de facto Big Ten West title game that eventually decided the title. And I, I believe it silenced the doubters long-term, kind of looking at it, they, even though they did lose to Michigan State and Ohio State, it, it – uh, it definitely sounds the dollars about Northwestern's legitimacy as a force in the West and showed that 2018 was, was just no fluke. And it's pretty funny after, I think this is right after the game. He says, how about those fighting Reese Davises right here? Huh? Joey Galloway. How about these fighting Reese Davises? Fitz says, <laughs> and like, like he said later, it just, added, it, I think it added fuel to the fire for Northwestern. They played with heart, they passion, they set a lot of records. They won a six, they won their sixth straight landed Lincoln trophy against Illinois in the final regular season game and then they come out against Auburn beating them 35-19 in the Citrus Bowl for Hankwitz's Mike Hankwitz uh story defensive coordinator his last game which was actually win number 400 so I don't know how much impact that's gonna have going forward but definitely during the season it provided a lot it provided a lot of momentum and motivation for the team and I I think it was just a glaring sight of how people viewed Northwestern I think that has definitely changed and that quote being said definitely changed that. Right. And I mean, I, I loved it. It was one of our big storylines after that Wisconsin <laughs> win because I picked you guys in that game. My co-host, who's taking a break right now, wasn't a believer. He's a big Wisconsin fan, weirdly, even though he's a, from Baton Rouge. But <laughs> August August 11th, man, mm-hmm. the Big Ten commissioner, Kevin Warren, made the announcement or decision to postpone the season only six days after he releases a new all-conference schedule was Northwestern one of the teams fighting back against this decision? And what was your initial reaction to his decision? So I know that Ohio State and Nebraska were very much in favor of playing games. And I remember the Cornhuskers were really trying to schedule opponents and play. And I remember reading in ESP, uh, ESPN, I believe, published this, that Nebraska, Ohio State, and I were the only teams that voted against the season. And Northwestern actually had a huge role kind of in this decision because the chair of the Big Ten, uh, the Big Ten chancellors and presidents, 
is Northwestern president, uh, Council of Presidents and Chancellors, excuse me, is Northwestern President Warren Shapiro, who during the vote um, states that the vote was made for the health, safety, and wellness of our student athletes. So kind of Northwestern does have a major role in that way of kind of leading the Big Ten, uh, leading those presidents and chancellors uh, counselor, um, and discussing with them what they want to do with playing football. And I, even though I didn't hear too much about Northwestern's opinion, kind of whether crossing between having a season and not having a season, there was obviously a large stake um, in the play to return. And Northwestern uh, had a big role in that. Jim Phillips, the former athletic director, who now is the commissioner of the ACC, chaired the Big Ten subcommittee of television. And he really emphasized kind of creating these TV rights and making sure that Big Ten teams, even though the season was going to be altered, could participate in the college football playoff and bowl games to make sure there was still this strong element of competition. And President Shapiro, um, who chaired the counselors and president, uh, who chaired the Big Ten counselors and presidents, as mentioned, he said the when the decision was made, I believe five weeks before, there was almost virtually no chance in his quotes that the conference could start competition. But Based on new medical uh, provisions that the conference was providing, he felt confident. He actually said, when the facts change, our mind change, our minds change. And there was a lot. There was daily COVID-19 testing, cardiac examination for athletes who tested positive, no public sale of tickets for Big Ten games. It's clear that the Big Ten, as a leader of college football, needed, to, needed in a sense, to return to the game. And that's what they did. But they definitely did that with a ton of provisions in place. Personally, for me, I... I completely understood this scene and I understood the course of action amid a pandemic with rising case rates across the country. It was hard to see a season happening, but I definitely did not rule out the season coming back because I believe the Pac-12 followed course, but I don't believe the SEC or the Big 12 or the ACC made any provisions. And the Big 10 considers itself one of the leaders of college football and one of these blue blood conferences. And even this year, you look at it, the Big 10 sent Ohio State, one of its member schools to the national championship game. And I feel like kind of as a leader of the power five, they were eventually going to come back to the negotiating table and find a way to have a season. Yeah, I'm glad they did. I'm sure Ohio State and the Big Ten in general, anytime you have a team go to the playoffs, I know all the schools benefit from that. So that's a huge thing. But earlier when I asked you about the season, you mentioned mm -hmm. Peyton Ramsey. He was a huge piece to this 2020 puzzle, and he showed a lot of growth throughout the season. He's gone now, and Pat Fitzgerald is left with a huge decision on who's going to lead this offense into the future. Who are the candidates, and who do you think we should expect to be QB1 for 2021? Mm -hmm. So with, this, with the extra year of eligibility, Ramsey has the option to come back. And he doesn't I, – I believe it was within the week or two after the bowl game, he posted a picture on Instagram of him raising the Citrus Bowl uh, MVP trophy and him saying a storybook ending. And based on that game – it was a phenomenal way to conclude his Northwestern career. And now he's off to the NFL draft. And the way I looked at it was Pat Fitzgerald, the two options. You could stay in-house and continue working with your quarterbacks. You've got Hunter Johnson, who did not live up to expectations after transferring from Clemson. There's Andrew Marty, who his best game of the season was the 2019 regular season finale against Illinois, did a phenomenal job on the ground. And then Aiden Smith, who also had some uh, uh, starting time in 2019, who opted out of 2020. And then you have the transfer portal and two quarterbacks in there who I believe Northwestern was going to look at, was going to look into were two quarterbacks who were offered by Fitzgerald when they were recruits in Jack Cohn and Ryan Holinsky. Cohn at Wisconsin eventually transfers to Notre Dame. And Ryan Holinsky finds his way to the former four star finds his way to Evanston as Pat Fitzgerald's quarterback of the future. And based on that, I believe that if you go into the transfer portal, you look for a quarterback who's going to be your day one starter. I think Fitzgerald and the team learned a really good, I wouldn't say lesson. I would say they learned to figure out kind of the best fit after kind of the Johnson transition didn't go as well as planned. And Peyton Ramsey obviously was a phenomenal fit for the, for the team. 12 touchdowns, uh, over, 1700, uh, 12, over 1,700 yards could be a dual threat. And, I believe that's what he's going to look for in 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 Ryan Holinsky, uh, the Southern California native. Fitz offered him in high school, um, and I think Fitz wouldn't go back to the portal if he didn't expect on getting a starter. And he has three seasons of eligibility, even though he didn't play last year at South Carolina, and that kind of I think had to do with 
a little bit of circumstances out of his control with Muschamp getting Mike Bobo after he was fired from South, uh, Colorado State and then bringing in Colin Hill. There was that familiarity between coach and coordinator, which I think made it a little harder for Holinsky to find his uh, way back into the starting role. But when he started, um, when he started in, in um, I believe it was 2019, he he did he did a lot of good stuff. He threw for over 2,300 yards, 11 touchdowns. He led South Carolina to a double overtime win against number three Georgia, completed 58% of his passes. So I'm really interested to see what he does in the Big Ten because I feel like, I feel like as I mentioned, bringing in Halinski, I think he might be the guy to help Northwestern continue this momentum because two Big Ten West championships in three years, I don't think the Wildcats intend to stop. And you need a quarterback to help do that. And that's obviously shown between 2019 and 2020 with the four man quarterback room and Peyton Ramsey. And I think Halinski is going to be the guy to lead them into the future, not just this season, but for the next few. Yeah. I mean, Halinski has a huge upside. I think he, like you said, he got the short end of the stick. I feel like at South Carolina, I mean, after he did what, I mean, they lost like three quarterbacks in like two weeks in 2019. He steps up. You said you talked about the win over Georgia, but I mean, that, that guy had so much potential. So that's a huge pickup mm-hmm. for Northwestern. And, you know, we t- you, keep, you call him Fitz, and he, he's one of my favorite coaches in the country. Pat Fitzgerald, been the coach at Northwestern for many years now, has had multiple outstanding seasons for the Wildcats. Mm-hmm. How has he been so successful at Northwestern, and what makes him such a special a special coach? He fits, Pat Fitzgerald is such a good team coach of getting players – vested into a system of turning Northwestern not just into a regional program in the Big Ten, but a national program on a national stage. When he took over in 2006, his first season, 4-8, and eight, and now in 2020, 15 years, 15 years, 7-2, AP Top 10, final ranking, and a Citrus Bowl win over Auburn, which is arguably the best bowl outside of the New Year's Six. And it's really impressive to look at his success. And also in this year, he reached – 100 wins, which is obviously a milestone, which is a completely phenomenal milestone. His player development staff, not only him, but also his coaches, is one of the best, if not the best in the country. If you look at players, Rashawn Slater, former three-star, only got five collegiate offers. Now he's going to be a likely top 15 pick. Ramad Chiaki Bowen, he came in as a three-star from Minneapolis. Um, I profiled RCB uh, this season and wrote an article about him, and I spoke to his high school coach who actually won the Bolitnikoff Award. I spoke to his teammates, and they were all like, his time is going to come. He's going to be ready. And this season, he he reels in 508 yards and five touchdowns. He's a guy who is an example of Pat Fitzgerald's able to develop and bring out, and he's able to make players better than when they arrived in Evanston. I mean, d- dozens of players you can list. Patty Fisher, who was a three-star. Ernest Brown the fourth, who was a four-star. J.R. Pace, three-star. Blake Gallagher, uh, three-star linebacker. Greg Newsom, three-star. So many of these guys are, are making impacts in the Big Ten. Greg Newsom, consensus all Big Ten team, consensus all Big Ten team, likely first-round pick. Uh, Blake Gallagher and Patty Fisher, who are two of the members of the Irish, uh, who are the Irish law firm, both, um, I believe, yeah, Fisher, four hundred four tackles, and then Gallagher is three hundred thirty-two, and also Fisher holds the most career tackles among all FBS players, and. What's really cool is that Fitzgerald, when he talks about players such as them, when he was talking about the linebackers, he said it's not even close when talking about himself as an athlete. All three of them, all three of these guys are a million times better athletes than I wish I ever could have been. And that's a kind of testament to the type of coach that he is and the type of stuff when a player is coming to look at Northwestern, you can look at guys like that and say, look how much I can develop. And that, that, that's fairly persuasive. He's also a phenomenal in-state recruiter. Northwestern calls itself Chicago's Big Ten team, and Pat Fitzgerald is living up to that name, and he's bringing in players who are helping Northwestern turn into Chicago's Big Ten team. Uh, the one that definitely comes to mind is Peter Skaronsky, uh fringe five-star pros- offensive lineman uh, from Park Ridge, who chose Northwestern over Notre Dame, Stanford, and Michigan. And Skaronsky was one of the best o- uh, offensive linemen in the country this year, especially among freshmen. It was incredibly impressive his ability to step into left tackle after Slater opts out and have the season that he had, arguably one of the hardest positions on the field. Um, Greg Newsom, he's from Carroll Stream, Illinois. 
Clayton Thorson, he's from Wheaton, Illinois, which is one hour away. And then Justin Jackson, who's the leading rusher in program history, he's from Glenbard, which is one hour away. And it's really impressive his ability to bring in recruits from in state, in right smack in Big Ten country, even though there's only Northwestern Illinois who aren't considered kind of those Big Ten blue blood powers. You are right around Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, Indiana. And even you might have Notre Dame encroaching into, even though they're not in the Big Ten, have them kind of encroaching into this Chicagoland area. And his ability to recruit is impressive. Just the other day, he brought in Reggie uh, Flurima, a four-star receiver who's the first commit in 2022. And he chose Northwestern over a bunch of Big Ten West programs. And that's showing that people believe in Pat Fitzgerald. And he really makes it a tantalizing destination for recruits. And you've got that triple threat of top 10, top 10 school. Um, academically top 10 in the AP poll, like after this year, then you've got a top 10 facility in the Ryan Fieldhouse and uh, Walter Athletic Center right on Lake Michigan. It, it's really impressive what this program has done. And Fitz, not just this season, he's racked up impressive wins. 2011 comes to mind when Northwestern upset number nine, Nebraska. It's, it's a multifaceted effort that he's able to have players buy into the vision, recruit players. It, it's impressive. And it's, it's, even though it's been 15 years, it's, it's paying off. Yeah, it has. And I feel like Fitzgerald, like there's just certain coaches. I mean, you look at, you know, I'm not saying Pat Fitzgerald is like Nick Saban or Davos Sweeney, but it's just one of those names where if they come into your living room as a recruit, you're going to have to hear them out. You're not going to turn down mm -hmm. a coaching visit from any of these guys. But you talk about the recruiting and on this podcast, man, I talk so much recruiting that it probably nauseates our listeners sometime. I love recruiting. And for this last cycle, the Wildcats signed a top 50 class. It was highlighted by the top recruit in the class was a kid from my hometown in Mobile, Alabama. Went to McGill, who my school, my high school played multiple times while I was there. What was the biggest positional needs for the Wildcats, and who are you most excited to see for this team? That, that was Jordan Mosley, right? Mm -hmm. from, yeah, that was a yep. – I remember he decommitted from Tennessee after their whole coaching, and I remember he committed to Northwestern, and I'm like, wow. I'm like, this, this is a big one. And yep. he, he, he's, he is mentioned, he's a four star. He's at the forefront of this class from looking at it. Receiver was a big need. Uh, Northwestern's three starting receivers are leaving RCB. Uh, Ramon Jackie Bowman declared for the draft. Riley Lee's declared for the draft. And then Kyrick McGowan transfers to Georgia tech. So there's obviously a big role to be filled. And there's guys that are going to fill that at the moment. You've got Wayne Dennis, Bryce Kurtz, Malik Washington, Stephon Robinson Jr., who's a transfer in from Kansas. But receiver was definitely a big spot to fill. And with Mosley, he's a top 50 receiver with the ability to shift Northwestern's passing attack into the future with the arrival of Helensky. And he gives Helensky, whether it's not this year or down the road, a threat who, who can probably make an impact very early on. And if you couple him with three-star Calvin Johnson II, who's from Mississippi, and then another three-star Jacob Gill, this team is really prioritizing receiver. It's definitely it's definitely a big need. And even though all these guys may not be kind of starting day one, they're setting the foundation for a successful wideout group in the future. And if you look at the success that RCB had this year in his senior year, it, it's a pretty impressive um, blueprint to look at because it shows how much better he got over time. And that definitely stands out to a receiver saying, okay, I can come here. I can play at the top level of the Big Ten. Northwestern got a four-star quarterback in Halinski who can definitely throw the ball well. It, it's going to be a fun place to play. Um, I definitely thought offensive lineman was a big need that was going to be fixed. Uh, even though Peter Skaronski stays, Slater um, obviously opted out. And then they lose some members in Gunnar Vogel and Nick Urban. And one of the uh, linemen that stands out to me is Caleb Tiernan, um, a four-star. Uh Getting Tiernan to Evanston showcased Fitz's ability to recruit in the heart of the Big Ten. He's he's from Michigan. He chose Michigan. Um, he chose Northwestern, excuse me, over schools such as uh, such as Michigan and uh, Penn State. And the ability to, as I mentioned, he's incredibly good in in the Chicagoland area. And the ability to go get kids from adjacent states with established Big Ten powers is incredibly impressive. And Tiernan is the type of player that if you see Skaronsky's success at tackle, it's promising to see that there are players already who are lining up to see um, to possibly be the next in a successful line of tackles or offensive linemen. And 
On the defensive side of the ball, two uh, recruits that really stand out to me are Najee Story and Mac Uline. Mac Uline is another player that represents Fitz's ability to do in-state recruiting. He's a four-star from Lake Forest, which is a few miles up the road from Evanston. And he also uh, chose some – he chose Northwestern over some offers from fellow Big Ten uh, powers such as uh, Purdue and Nebraska. And it really shows that priority that I, I keep touching on of in-state Northwestern's a rising power. The fact that Northwestern's becoming a focal point of the Big Ten West is really crucial. Those, those two division titles in three years show that 2018 was no fluke. This team's really on the come up and recruits are starting to see that. And that's what I saw with the U-line commitment. And my last one, is, uh, my last recruit I'm going to talk about is Najee Story, a defensive end uh, from Solon, Ohio. This is another similarity to other recruits. He got him out of Big Ten country. And Najee Story does not just come from Ohio, which obviously has Big Ten power, Ohio State. He was offered by dozens of college of football powers across the country, Alabama, Notre Dame, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio State, Tennessee. And getting him after losing Ernest Brown the fourth to the NFL draft and Eku Leota, who ironically um, ended up transferring to Auburn after yeah. Northwestern beat them in the uh, in the Citrus Bowl, it shows that this is a class that comes on the heels of one of, if not the best season in program history. And it shows that it's going to continue. This is a program that's continuously going to be on the rise. Yeah, and I mean, as much as fans, I feel like the average fan, so I've talked about this on our podcast, the average fan doesn't realize that Northwestern's been to two Big Ten titles in three years. They don't – I think they overlook how good this program is. And in terms of, you know, the transfer to Auburn, we appreciate it. Our D-line is atrocious. I'm sure you saw that. We really needed some help. So appreciate you there. But talking about all these young guys and – I want to shift to the 2021 season. What players do we not know about now that we should know about and that could have their breakout season next year? So I'm really looking forward to seeing Malik Washington, uh, a wide receiver, junior from Georgia. During preseason camp last year, offensive coordinator Michael Jockian was asked who are some young players kind of making plays and showing their progress during practice. And he said Washington was one of them. Uh, he was eventually injury played. He only played in five games, caught five passes for 51 yards and kind of didn't play the final four games of the season, uh, including the bowl game. It, it, it was kind of an unfortunate uh, 2020 to a player who was so highly praised in camp. And he actually entered the transfer portal. And it turns out after a little bit, Washington comes back to Evanston. And with a new quarterback coming in, I'd be very optimistic about his production. Bajakian, who has worked with quarterbacks from Jameis Winston – to Peyton Ramsey this year when he worked when he was with the Bucks, he definitely, as I said, he knows how to get the the ball in his playmaker's hands, and I feel like Washington's going to be one of those players. And you could even say the same thing about other receivers. Bryce Kurtz finished the season with 67 receiving yards, and Wayne Dennis, who caught a 23 yard pass in the Citrus Bowl. This is a really young wide receiver room that's going to definitely be aided by the arrival of Halinski in that he has playing experience already and he's played against top teams and he's even beaten top teams. And I think that's going to elevate receivers, mostly Washington to another level. And looking to outside of the program, another receiver, Stefan Robinson Jr. He's a transfer from Kansas in 2019. He caught 727 yards and eight touchdowns, 15.1 yards per catch. That really stands out to me because that signifies Northwestern has another deep threat to replace the role that RCB was kind of moved into. We had that 35-yard touchdown against Auburn. He was kind of the deep guy you would look for. And he's fast. And even though he only played three games because of injury in 2020, he's another quick receiver who can elevate and use passing game to another level. And if Helinski can get the ball to his playmakers, which is, as I mentioned, a key tenant of the Jockeyans offensive philosophy, this is a great sign. On the yeah. defensive side uh of the ball – oh, sorry – Oh, I was just about to say, and not only that, I mean, Helensky is a huge step up from what Kansas has at quarterback. I mean, oh, yeah. that quarterback situation at Kansas is atrocious, to say the least. Yeah, de definitely. I, I feel like bringing in a quarterback is one thing, and bringing in a quarterback and coupling him with not only receivers you develop in the program, but receivers you're able to bring in outside is impressive. And looking at Robinson – the, the fact that you're able to draw a receiver who puts up those type of numbers to Northwestern is another testament to this program becoming a destination. 
and shifting to the defensive side of the ball, cornerback Cameron Mitchell, um, really impressive. He actually allowed the lowest completion rate in the Big Ten at 33%, actually ahead of Greg Newsom, who had 35, and Newsom's now likely a first-round pick. It's a really impressive statistic. And he – six passes defended. He made a phenomenal sideline interception and a great sack of Justin Fields in the Big Ten championship game. And then in the Citrus Bowl, he makes career-high six, six tackles and then a career-high two pass breakup. So his ability to show up on the biggest stages – and make plays really is promising looking into next season in 2021 with a room that loses uh, that loses Newsom, who was one of the best cornerbacks, if not the best in the conference. And in, it's pretty impressive to couple his performance also with the arrival of Jim O'Neill as defensive coordinator. He's coached all around the defensive side of the ball in the NFL, in college. He was last secondaries coach. Uh, with the loss with the Oakland and then when they moved Las Vegas Raiders. So getting a defensive coordinator who really caters to the secondary, I think is going to boost the unit's overall performance. And then you already have players like Brandon Joseph. And I mean, Brandon Joseph, his, his play shows why he's one of the best in the country. Uh, let, um, had six interceptions last year, first team, all big 10, big 10 freshman of the year. And coupling a strong cornerback play, it, it's it, it's going it's going to be a very good unit. Yeah, uh, I, I'm excited for this team. I think they're good. I think it's a more reload season, more so than a rebuild. And I'm looking at the schedule, man. Looking at next year, I think this is has this is the schedule made for another Big Ten championship run for Northwestern. I mean, there there are the difficult games, of course, Wisconsin. Iowa, Minnesota, along with an interesting out of conference game that could be sneaky in Duke. Mm -hmm. What, but what do you think is the ceiling and or floor for the 2021 Northwestern team? I think the ceiling is a third Big Ten West championship in four years, and I think the floor is a nine and three, eight and four team. They, I don't think this Northwestern team's a even at a 500 or sub 500 team. I think this team is on the come up and it's going to keep that momentum, even if it doesn't win another uh, division title and meet uh, the East champion in Indianapolis. Some, uh, it's a very interesting season. You've got the full slot of 12 games kind of shifting away from the co uh, the COVID altered um, schedule. I would argue that I don't think Northwestern got it too bad with non-conference with Ohio and Indiana state though. Duke is very interesting. In four straight, the, the teams played for four straight years, 2015 to 2018. Northwestern won two and then Duke won two, but Duke's won the last two, 41 to 17 in Durham, where Northwestern's going in 2021, and then 21 7 in Evanston, which was the year that Northwestern made their run to the Big Ten West uh, title game in 2018. And historically, Northwestern won six straight in Durham before that 2017 loss. So I think it's intriguing. This this game is going to be very intriguing. Even though Duke went two and nine last year and allowed thirty eight points per game, and their quarterback Chase Bryce, who came in from Clemson, I believe he transferred to Appalachian State after not being the answer for Duke. That's a game where I, I, I would it, it, it's it would it may be a trap game, and I definitely think with non conference these games tend to test opponents because it's not a typical Big Ten conference. You're playing in a different league with teams with different offensive philosophies and kind of different things at stake. So non-conference for Northwestern, I, I think Duke is obviously the highlight of that non-con schedule. And I think especially because it's early on, it could be a defining factor to what this team could do. And shifting into the conference, you've got a great opening game against Michigan State, which happens against Duke in Evanston. Michigan State won 31-10 last time. Northwest last time they played Northwestern and Evanston and then last year's upset when Northwestern was number eight in the country. Like there's obviously a lot of bad blood there. And I think Northwestern's going to want to come out hot, especially in the opening game. And I think that's a definitely a game that can set the tone. There's a five game stretch in the middle of the season at Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, at Wisconsin, Purdue, which is at Wrigley field. No buys. The buy comes before that stretch will define Northwestern season. When you look at Michigan, I'm very interested in that team. The last time Northwestern went to the big house, it was 38 to zero. Michigan won. Northwestern was actually ranked higher than Michigan at number 13 versus the Wolverines being 18. And obviously in 2020, the Wolverines did not perform as they wanted to expect. And they've underwent a lot of change 
uh, Jim Harbaugh has his contract restructured. He brought in a, a much younger coaching staff. Um, and some even had links to the area, such as Ron Bellamy, who previously coached at West Bloomfield High School, the same place that four-star running back Donovan Mitchell is from, and uh, Donovan um, Edwards, excuse me. And they're both headed uh, to Ann Arbor. And there's a pressure to win uh, for the maize in blue. J.J. McCarthy, who was actually at LaGrange, um, who was actually at Nazareth in LaGrange Park, Illinois, before transferring to IMG, he was offered by Northwestern. He's a five-star. Now he's at Michigan, and he's in the running for the day one starter in Ann Arbor. So that's definitely one of the hard games on the road. They've got other games, Memorial Stadium in Lincoln when they play Nebraska, obviously already the big house. They're playing at Camp Randall in Madison. Those are tough environments and massive stadiums with a lot of hyped up fans. And I don't know what the Big Ten's uh, protocol is going to be for fans in the stands, but those are hard. That may play a role if it's fully uh, if it's fully filled. And the thing that interests me the most is as Northwestern gets better, so do their opponents. Wisconsin and Iowa are the two schools I specifically look for kind of in this comparison. Graham Mertz, who shocked the country by going 20 for 21 and throwing for nearly 250 yards in the opening game of the season against Illinois, had a phenomenal start to the season. Obviously, he and his team got affected by COVID, and Northwestern played incredibly well against Mertz. I believe he threw three, I believe he threw three interceptions and had a fumble. And but Mertz had now has another year under his system and He's going to likely have a full offseason, and so is Spencer Petrus at Iowa. Northwestern played Iowa in the second game of the season last year. They were down 17-0, to ecked out a 21-20 to win. But now Petrus has another year under his belt, and Iowa ended the year on a six-game win streak. So this shows that quarterback play now is all the more important. And bringing in Halinski, I think Northwestern is doing that by putting a guy they can insert, hopefully, in their program, not just for this season, but long-term. And I think that's what's going to define these matchups. And it's interesting also to see what Jim O'Neill is going to bring to this defense. Um, obviously, the Big Ten, a lot of smash mouth football, hard football. And Northwestern was one of the best defensive teams in the country last year, allowed less than 16 points, uh, one of the best scoring defenses in the country. So it, it's going to be an interesting to see in, in 2021. And that stretch, as I mentioned, is going to define the season and that, that could be the difference between an 8-4 and four average season. You're going to a not terrible bowl game or an 11-1, and 12-0 Big Ten West uh, title for the third time in four years season. Right. I think that door might be a little uh, – it might be cracked at least to maybe even upset Ohio State because they're breaking in a new quarterback. Mm-hmm. They, they lost a lot of pieces from this, oh, yeah. this past team. Um, but, you know, man, I love asking this question. So I, I got to ask, I haven't been able to make it to a Northwestern game yet, mm-hmm. but I want to shift to the environment of Evanston and Ryan Field. What makes this town, this stadium, this environment so unique on game day? So funny, funny you ask. So I've actually only been to Ryan Field as a fan. Uh, really? Last year, Northwestern, during the fall, freshmen and sophomores were not allowed to live on campus due to um, – issues created by the coronavirus. So I covered every game except for the Big Ten Championship in Indianapolis, basically from my couch, basically typing, watching the game on ESPN or Big Ten Network or whatever game was on or whatever channel it was on. But it's awesome. And it's something I really look forward to. Um, Not only comparing the experiences I've had as a student and but also kind of when I, when I'm a reporter, I remember one of my friends who was actually uh, one of my friends who was an upper class was at the game after the Wisconsin game. And he's like, if fans were here, it would be unbelievable. Just the feel around the stadium and just the knowledge. This was a program defining win. But when you're there on game day, the parking lots are packed outside Ryan field. And you've got student, you've got a great student, you've got a great student section there. You've got alumni who come to support the purple and white. You've got, Evanston town residents as the, as the stadium's a bit away from campus. And it's really cool when all the students just bust there and there are buses lined up and everybody just heads in to the gate and everybody just gets passionate to watch the cats. Um, the night games are or both the day games and the night games are special, but the night games are kind of on another level. Uh, the night, the first night game I went to as a student was when number four Ohio state came to town. And yeah, we lost 52 to three and with the, with the bleachers in the student section cleared mostly by the end of the third quarter. Yeah. But 
it was awesome. Fully packed. Everybody was standing. My friends and I got there two hours early just to see everybody warm up. That was the most awesome I had seen Ryan Field. It was electric. And Ohio State, as basically every college football fan knows, they travel. And they brought the energy too. And just combining those two factors. And also Ryan Field, only stadium in uh, football bowl subdivision to not have permanent lighting. And kind of when those lights turn on, you know it's game time. And that's a special experience. And Devin, there's so many kind of great Evanston institutions, Muster's Last Stands, a legendary restaurant around there. I haven't had time to make it over there, but I definitely plan on doing it. And now that Northwestern has the season that it's going to have, that it had in 2020, I just feel like the fan experience is going to be so much more amplified. It's such a part of Evanston and residents, students, alumni, they all come back. And I remember being at the homecoming game and that was just fully clad, everybody purple and white cheering on the cats. That's a special experience. And even though it's, it only seats 47,000 people. Ryan Field's a special place. And Evanston, when there's a win on game day, people get excited. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that is uh, – you, you see a lot of these underrated stadiums around the country. Man, I'm a stadium person. I want to try to get to this stadium. I want to try to get to a Northwestern game, especially mm-hmm. at the peak of this, man. Just come see Pat, yeah. Pat Fitzgerald's team play. I'm sure it's amazing. But, man, I appreciate you coming on here. I know everything's been crazy with the Big Ten, with college football, everything going on. So appreciate you making uh, some time yeah, here. But where can, our, where can our uh, listeners find you, man? Where can they find you on social media, any articles, podcasts, anything you do, man? Where can they find you at? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at D-S-C-H-O-T-T-328. That's my Twitter account. Um as I mentioned, I'm the web editor of the Daily Northwestern. Um, I cover a wide variety of sports. I cover football in the fall. I'm actually currently covering women's basketball, who's the number seven, uh, one of the seven seeds in the NCAA tournament. They've got a big game against Louisville tomorrow. And yeah, all my articles, I usually share all my articles, so you can read some stuff there along with some sports takes, which you may or may not agree with. <laughs> um, I usually do pretty good. I usually back all my stuff up in analysis. Um and yeah, on the Daily Northwestern, I have a web page where you can read a lot of my stuff. Um, and yeah, definitely. And then this summer, I'll be working at Times Media Group and Varsity Extra, which is a local group of papers out in Arizona's East Valley, which is just outside of Phoenix. So I'll be doing some reporting on high school sports there. So yeah, basically, that's that's where you can find me. And if any of you want to talk Northwestern football, Big Ten football, just send me a DM on Twitter or email me. Uh, absolutely man guys make sure to go follow drew stay up to date on all things all things northwestern i promise you this is going to be a program y'all are going to want to follow into the season and into the future man we'll definitely have to do this again i'll be reaching back out closer to football season when we get into the swing of things and if i make it up to evanston for a game and we can have fans i'll definitely hit you up we'll have to yeah, let me know let me know there but Guys, this is a wrap on this episode. We only got two more schools for Big Ten in 31 days. So Maryland and Iowa are coming later this week and at the beginning of next week. We already got big guests lined up for Big 12 in 30 days next month. But guys, y'all know where to find us. But for myself, for Drew, and for the Blue Bloods, we are out.